Hi, hi everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, we'll see how it works out. My, it seems like the, the Wi-Fi and my Tesla don't like each other. So let's see. Welcome to uh, Stop or My Duke Will Shoot. The idea is uh, to get some shooting here with the missile launcher. We'll see how that works. Um, I hope you enjoyed the day so far. I certainly did. And um, lots of interesting topics. And a thousand ideas about this rather young topic of Internet of Things. And here's another idea in this talk. One of uh, this idea, thousand and one. You know? It's not the one that rules everything else. Um, anyway, it is, it is based on an interesting observation. And I'll give you the ob observation and the idea right in the beginning. <laughs> Uh, the spoiler comes in the beginning, in the first five minutes. So you can leave after five minutes if you've understood this, right? Um, I work for Canoe in Basel, Switzerland. We do lots of graphical user interfaces and architecture around this and presentation architecture and so on. And when we thought about Internet of Things, um, we thought of such a device like a microcontroller, like this one, or um, even a missile launcher, from our perspective, looks like a user interface. Right? If you have um, an LED blinking, like this red one, and LED blinking is the hello world of IoT, I guess you know that. Um, this is like a checkbox on a user interface. Graphical user interface, a checkbox. If it's marked, it's red. If it's not marked, it's not red. Right. Exact same thing. If there is um, any kind of power running through the cable, it's on. If it's on, it's like the, the cornerstone of software, right? The, uh, power or no power on a cable is like a checkbox that you set. And from a programmer's perspective, setting a checkbox, setting an LED, um, firing a missile is not necessarily different, right? So why, do, why should we have any kind of different um, programming model for that? We should just set a value and then things happen. And whether this is finally rendered as a checkbox on a UI or LED blinking or missiles firing hmm, is, is um, implementation detail. Right? We, we would say it's a binding detail, how the information is bound to the actual device. And that's it. That's the observation. And uh, from that observation, we said, well, we can employ the exact same architecture that we have for user interfaces um, for these Internet of Things, for these things, right? Because they are connected to the Internet. Otherwise, it would not be Internet of Things, it would be things. So we have some kind of, um, of channel to them. And if it was so that they only send us information we would not care so much. If it was only a sensor giving us information, we would not see this as a user interface. Interface means you know, interaction back and forth. And if we would, lots of sensors are this way. You know, if you have thousand sensors, they send you information, you collect them on the server, there's no need for a special programming model. And um, if you have, if you're only sending information out, like to a dashboard, to a kiosk system or something, you just send information out, like on a TV screen, where there's no interaction, almost no interaction, why care? This is not like a user interface. But as soon as you have this kind of interplay, and um, if the demo gods are with me, I'm kind of scary. To just, it worked like half an hour before, but now it has some problems with Wi-Fi here. Uh, I'd like to show you that with these devices, even the smallest devices, you have some kind of interaction, even though you're probably not aware of this. And we will see why. So, without further ado, here it comes. These, um, these actuators that we have here, sensors and actuators, uh, are controlled by a presentation model architecture that we call Open Dolphin. It's, like the name suggests, open source. Um, based on Java and available in Java and JavaScript. It is in it itself is an application architecture or presentation layer architecture. Um, it's kind of it extends into the Internet of Things just like I described. 
Interestingly, it supports multiple users at the same time. For example, the, the blue one in the back is a Java FX view, um, maintaining team members, assembling team members for a team. And then there is a JavaScript view, like HTML5, whatever, showing the exact same information with lots of interesting details in it. One is uh, these both screens are visible at the same time, multiple users using it at the same time, and everybody's seeing live edits from the other one. For example, um, here we have uh, Marie Claude, and this is, this is in, um, in bold because this is currently considered dirty information. It has been changed by one user, and it's also visible on the, on the blue one up there, so with a different kind of background color, uh, if that is visible, to make also visible that somebody else is currently editing that information. So you have multiple views, automatically synchronized, if you want. And also on multiple channels, like one is uh, JavaScript and web, and the other one is Java Desktop. So that's the kind of thing that we already have. I mean, not everybody has that, I know. But this is this kind of state of the art, and, and it scales to uh, many thousand users, right? If you want. Maybe not millions, but as, you know. Um, it even scales to millions. For example, Facebook has kind of the same architecture. I'm not quite sure whether you're aware. If you, if you open Facebook and you, create a f you start creating a post, but you haven't posted it yet, you didn't push the post button, this information already goes to the server and could be harvested on the server and actually is used by Facebook. They know what you have written, even before you post it. So if you start like, Boss, you are the last person on the planet, isn't it? But then you decide not to send it, they already know. That's kind of the same architecture, it's a live update, right? Live synchronization that you can do once the information is on the server. So the same thing uh, can happen with devices. You can do the very same thing. Multiple users is just like multiple devices. And here's the general the architectural, meaning the, the structural part of the architecture. Architecture is structure in concepts. Here's structure. Model view and controller, I guess that everybody has seen that before. But the point here is um, controller lives on the server side. The view lives on the client side. And they synchronize with presentation models. This is where the information is. Um, the OK information should be on. And whether this on the client side, client side view is then with an LED or with a checkbox or any kind of uh, relay that's in there, that is then a question of the binding. The binding happens between the client side instance of the model and the view. This is statically set up usually. And then all the information logic is on the server side, and the information logic in the controller is just like. I'm, setting, I'm reading a value, I'm setting a value, I listen for value changes. That's all there is. Three primitives, nothing else. And with that you can build a really big application. Simplicity scales. So, uh, ah, I was a bit too fast. Let me, let me thank you. This is, happens not so often, but could be actually the reason for that thing that I had here. What's up, man? So. Uh, maybe because of the resolution. Let me, let me quickly choose a very a bit less is Yep. Much better. Much better. Could actually be that we can show the demo. So, again. Good. So, the point now is that the view, which is usually graphical user interface, HTML5, Swing, JavaFX, SVT, Eclipse RCP, whatever. SWD. 
is now a device. That's all what changes. Everything else in the architecture stays the same, including the concepts behind this. There's concepts about asynchronousity and who knows whom and so on. So with multiple clients, just, you just have two of those and an event bus on the server side such that the controllers can talk to each other about anything that is of interest for them. Who has been in the um, open hub talk this morning? Oh, many? Oh, that's, you have already seen that architecture, right? Open hub is almost the same architecture. There's a big overlap. Even though that's the, the area of applicability is a bit different, so the domain is a bit different, but there's lots of overlap in the architecture. And then we can use multiple different devices, um, hardware devices, software devices, devices as a mix. The first application that we had seen had two software GUIs, Swing and JavaFX, uh, sorry, JavaScript, Web, and uh, JavaFX. And one of those can be replaced with an, with an hardware device, right? And they both work on the exact same, not equal, but same, the, uh, another instance of the same application on the server side. What, what we program in, our program code, is the exact same. There's not a single line of difference. And there's not, it's not cluttered with if then so and so, and if then so and so, and if it's a hardware device, then this, and if it's, this, well, no, no. It's exact same logic and totally unaware, that's the trick, totally unaware on how this happens to be rendered or implemented or haptically available on the client side. And that means, um, that's the architectural part, one sense, uh, in, in one client it can be a sensor, for example, any kind of hardware thing, and a UI on the other channel so to speak. That's the whole idea. If you have that idea, you have, you have it. Right? <laughs> I'm, I'm not quite sure about you, but when I'm at conferences, I always think, when I leave the, the talk, I ask, what, what do I take from the talk with me? What can I remember tomorrow about the talk? And then it comes to me that I, I'm happy if I remember what talk I was in the next day. <laughs> But if you take one thing away from this talk is, you know, UI, IoT devices are just UIs in a different form. And we can program them if we want, here's the idea, in the exact same way as we program UIs, or as the open parent, if we program UIs correctly, close parent, right? That's a bit of a thing. So it, it, you can have Open Dolphin, and we actually have it on a Raspberry Pi. It's very thin Java server-side part. And we use it actually for, um, at, the, at our office, at the Canoe office. If you look above there the, with the LED, huh, right over there, that's the Raspberry Pi. You will see it in, the, in that case. And below here is a screen showing our meeting rooms and who's currently in which meeting room, what are the scheduled meetings, right? So that turned out to be uh, <laughs> an extremely valuable device. Um, for one reason, you know who is in which room, and, but most of all, you know, if I go to this room, they will not kick me out in the next 10 minutes or so. But, uh, yeah. Awesome. And this Raspberry Pi connects on the server side to the, um, to the corporate calendar and reads the information and displays it on the screen. Nice thing that we did. In, um, in the infamous canoe code camp. Where we can, it's a code retreat where we hack like crazy for three days and two nights. Actually, the, um, it currently happens these days. If I wouldn't be here, I would be at canoe code camp. I hope you appreciate that. <laughs> so, and um, yeah, it's actually used in, in a number of places. Here we have it running on a Raspberry Pi with a temperature reading. This, this is not from canoe or from our part. This is from um, Todd Costella, and he presented this as Java at Java One. Um, he runs a chicken farm in Calgary. So Calgary is close to the Rocky Mountains, or to the Cascades at, at that point, and they sometimes have uh, temperature drops like 40 degrees in half a day. 
And if you run a chicken farm and you don't want to have frozen chicken, you better look after the temperature. Here it is, minus 13 degrees. And, and here you see the typical, typical way of using dolphin. Here is the, the client side of the dolphin. You create a presentation model for the temperature. Hmm. Yeah, that's it. And then you set values on it and so. It's just by accident that it looks like this. Here you see some, the typical log output. And multiple UIs bound to the exact same information. Here's a Java FX UI as a gauge, and here is, an, that's a, if I'm not mistaken, a Swing UI, and another Java FX Elite LCD component. Yes, and now I'd like to show you the exact same information running on the server side, once as a Java FX view on the capabilities of these, this device and I'd like to control it with the JavaFX application. So if, I, if I'm switching on an LED, it should go on here. Now this red light means the Wi-Fi doesn't work. And this cable, by the way, is only for the power. Otherwise, it is connected for Wi-Fi. So I need to set this up correctly. Give me a second. Since I had only a few minutes for preparation time, that was a bit difficult. Anyway, so let's go. So this one did not work. I will actually... <gasps> yellow! Yellow is good. <laughs> so, um, I'll try to... Um, if, if, if there's an, a volunteer who would hold this up for me, such that the others can see it, would you like to come in and just do me a favor? Thank you so much. Usually this is where the audience gives a lot for the audience. <laughs> so... Tesla. Yeah. <laughs> You're supposed to be a girl right now, you know. <laughs> so first the URL the URL things. Now first I have to start the server, right? So there's an, a server a server part of the thing. Please tell me when it goes from yellow to red. <laughs> so Server needs to start. Server-side component is a Java enterprise, respectively. It's, it needs a Surflet engine version 2.5 or higher, which is pretty much like Tomcat since 10 years or so. And then, here the server is running. Now we go to the client side and start the Tesla. By the way, uh, I have to first go to the right directory. CD ambient JS IoT Tesla run spike JS. Okay. This is now this this will now start. Um, oh, sorry. I have, I have to explain that thing. A small microcontroller who which runs JavaScript natively on the metal. And then you can attach all kinds of sensors and actuators and so to this one. It's like like Lego, right? <laughs> Lego is together. It's, it's really pretty cool and very easy to program. It runs JavaScript and you can, so there's a, the JavaScript client of OpenDolphin is on this device. It will read an ambient light and sound sensor, which is on this one. The sound sensor and the light is, um, is not like uh, for, for recording voice or singing or something. It is ambient. That means the general loudness of things, right? So we, we will probably see that. No, oh, it cannot con it cannot connect to that one. Could we please give me G S news E Printlin INET address localhost. See what IP port we have. That looks good. Why are we not Connecting. So it's deploying the bundle. That means you have, you have a bit of JavaScript and you put it on the device. It should actually start and then it calls to the server and um, asks for information. Actually, it's, it's, it's synchronizing these presentation model values and uh, it cannot connect. Is that, is that still yep. like so? Too bad. 
I, I actually think I have to thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. Problem. <laughs> so I can only tell you what should have happened, and we will actually go for the other demo. <laughs> so what we have, um, second thing that we have here is a local device. So this, this device has at least JavaScript. If we have an, a Raspberry Pi, it has even Java, right? This has only JavaScript. But this here is uh, like an, an, a toy that you can have at your office, right? the, one of these office toys. And it doesn't even have JavaScript, it has pretty much nothing. It is a local device bound to my computer that I somehow want to control. It accepts keystrokes. I can send it keystrokes. Mm. Okay. But um, anyway, I'd like to control it just like any other application. So the idea is that I start the remote shooter. Start, start remote shooter. Is that on the other hand? Is that okay? That is okay. Good. This is coming up. And then I'm going to control it with the iPad mini. And multiple things that I have to do at the same time. So, is that coming up? Where are you? Over here. Some, somehow this... Are you here? You have to restart it, huh? I guess the change of resolution was somehow too much. Oh, so start remote shooter. That was okay. I, I did it wrong. Here is the shooter still running. Very good. Then I need the remote rocket view that was missing. I did it wrong. It was my fault. The shooter is the one that actually controls the shooter. And here is... You know, I've, I've shown this at Java 1. This is actually the picture from Java 1. So you're safe. Yeah? <laughs> so here's the one that, where I control um, that thing over here. Let's put it over here. So, And then I'd like to go to a website. Actually, I'd, this is all running through my iPhone hotspot which is connected over roaming to Switzerland, where I come from. I hope you appreciate my phone bill <laughs> for this. Uh, and then, oh yeah, okay. So with this sensor, with the, with the um, Lager sensor, what's that, the, well, you know, when I tilt it. So if I tilt it to the side, it goes to that side. If I tilt it to the other side, it goes to this side. And I can actually also, uh, if I know where my thing is over here, in the missile launcher. No, the missile launcher also goes to this and this and this and this and that. Almost, so I didn't position it correctly, calibrating it. So you're a little bad luck on that side. <laughs> so the, um, the initial idea was that you would all try to put this one to the other side of the room with your iPhone or with your smartphone and then fire it by shearing up as loud as you can. But now as the Tesla is not running and, and recognizing the sound, I have to do it, right? So, on, and, 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 poof. <laughs> Aye! <laughs> Too bad. So, Without Wi-Fi, things don't work. This may be a lesson for IoT anyway. <laughs> Without the Wi-Fi, you have bad luck. Anyway, and, uh, but another point here for that, uh, oh, yes, that was the wrong thing anyway. Um, I'll do this over the presentation. Um, the point is, you need some kind of interactivity with your device. And I usually have this uh, in, the, in the demo like so for making the LEDs, like this blue LED here, um, putting it in place, I, I click on that blue LED over here, just for enabling it. And only when enabled, 
it will listen for the sound spikes, right, and then firing the missiles and so on. So pretty often you have a device that um, is usually silent or sends like every five minutes a keep alive, but you kind of enable it if you want to have more information, right? Or it is only sending information at, um, at, a, at a small bandwidth, usually until, you, until it becomes interesting for some reason, right? And you'd like to control this from the server side. And then it gives you more information until you throttle it again, and then it gets less. So there's some kind of interactivity in it. And my use case for that was actually <laughs> um, when I'm away on speaking on a conference, and um, I expect at home everything to be dark and silent. Now, if my children <laughs> uh, would like to throw a party when I'm not there, I would recognize this by light and sound and could fire the missiles. Well, anyway. <laughs>